tonight. Terrifying turbulence. A flight turns fatal low at Singapore Airlines as unfortunate wind conditions cause some serious shaking, leaving dozens injured and an unfortunate death. Morning on Mars. Thousands of Iranians flood the streets in sorrowful remembrance of the passing President Ibrahim Raisi. The solemn situation sees some dissent from protesters. Playing fair? The ICC issuing warrants on both Israel and Hamas leaders sees mutual condemnation. The slap on the wrist doing a little to nothing at decelerating the conflict. And sleeping giant. One gator's choice to take a quick snooze on Florida Street leaves an awkward encounter for authorities. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Avadarana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Varnasuriya. Good evening, you're joining us on World News. Well, thank you for taking your time to tune in. Let's get you up to date with the latest from across the world, starting off with the turbulent situation at Singapore Airlines. Well, more than 140 travelers and crew members who were on board a flight hit by severe turbulence landed in Singapore on a relief flight early this morning. Passengers on board SQ-321, which was heading from London to Singapore, recounted scenes of absolute terror, with one passenger saying he saw a woman with awful gash on her head and heard another screaming in agony. A 73-year-old British man was killed and injured passengers were stretched off a Singapore Airlines flight from London on Tuesday after the plane fell into an air pocket before encountering turbulence, the airline and officials said. Forced to make an emergency landing in Bangkok, dozens were taken to hospital, including one crew member, according to a senior airport official. The tarmac became a makeshift emergency room to treat the injured. The senior airport official said the British man likely died due to a heart attack, while seven people were critically injured with head injuries. A passenger on board told the plane tilted upwards and began shaking. Then he said a dramatic drop saw people launched into baggage cabins overhead, their bodies denting and breaking the panels. A spokesperson for Flight Radar 24 said data analysis from the plane's journey shows the plane tilting upwards and returning to its cruising altitude over the space of a minute. The Boeing 777-300 ER plane with 211 passengers and 18 crew was headed to Singapore, the airline said. Singapore Airlines in a statement offered its deepest condolences to the family of the deceased and apologised for the traumatic experience for passengers and crew. Turbulence related airline accidents are the most common type according to a 2021 study by the National Transportation Safety Board. Widely recognised as one of the world's leading airlines and a benchmark for much of the industry, Singapore Airlines has not had any major incidents in recent years. The airline said it is working with Thai authorities to provide all necessary assistance. Bowen said it was also ready to provide support. Over in Iran now, the Cyril remains as tens of thousands of Iranians gather to mourn President Ibrahim Raisi and seven members of his entourage who were killed in a helicopter crash on the Fox Shouden mountainside. Iran's Supreme Leader performed prayers in Tehran ahead of the funeral. Thousands of mourners descended on the Iranian city of Tabriz on Tuesday to mourn President Ibrahim Raisi. <laughs> he was killed in a helicopter crash near the Azerbaijan border on Sunday, along with his foreign minister and seven others. State TV broadcast images showing many dressed in black, crowding a truck covered in white flowers which carried caskets wrapped in Iran's national flag. Mourners carried posters of Raisi, Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullahian, and other officials who were killed in the crash. Despite the turnout, some insiders see a stark contrast in public grief compared to past commemorations for the deaths of other senior figures in the Islamic Republic's 45-year history. Iran proclaimed five days of mourning for Raisi. But there was little of the emotional rhetoric that accompanied the death of Qasem Soleimani, a senior commander of Iran's elite Revolutionary Guards killed by a US missile in 2020 in Iraq. His funeral drew huge crowds of mourners, weeping with sorrow and rage. The helicopter crash that killed Raisi also comes at a time of deepening crisis between the clerical leadership and society at large. Major issues range from the tightening of social and political controls to economic hardship. 
The mood bodes ill for an early presidential election on June 28. Iran's rulers will hope they can stir up enough public enthusiasm to secure high participation in the vote, after a historically low turnout of around 41% in March's parliamentary election. Widespread public anger at worsening living standards and pervasive graft may keep many Iranians at home, as well as memories of the handling of nationwide unrest sparked by the death of a young Iranian Kurdish woman in 2022 while in custody. Raisi's body was flown from Tabriz, the closest major city to the remote crash site, to Tehran airport before heading to the holy Shiite Muslim city of Qom. It will then return to lie at Tehran's Grand Masala Mosque before being transferred to his hometown of Mashhad for burial on Thursday. Political change is happening in our region. Vietnam's parliament elected police minister To Lam as the state's president, a move analysts see as a stepping stone for Lam to bid later for the position of the chief of the ruling Communist Party, the country's top job. Lam's election followed the appointment by Vietnam's National Assembly of its new chairman, formerly deputy Tran Tan Man, possibly bringing to a temporary end two months of heightened political turbulence, which saw the exit of three of Vietnam's top five leaders over unspecified wrongdoings. As head of public security ministry, Lam has been a crucial figure in a sweeping anti-craft campaign known as Blazing Furnace, which is aimed at rooting out widespread corruption but has also been seen by critics as a tool to sideline opponents during political infighting. The state president holds a large ceremonial role but is one of the country's top four political positions, the so-called Four Pillars. The others are the party chief, the prime minister and the parliament speaker. And over in neighbouring India now, we see a scorching situation. New Delhi residents are bracing the sweltering heat as temperatures climb above 45 degrees Celsius with the India Meteorological Department forecasting no respite from the ongoing heat wave. According to the Meteorological Department, the Indian capital recorded the season's hottest day with the mercury soaring 47.4 degrees Celsius. The surrounding states including Haryana, Punjab, Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh were also hit by the heat wave with some issuing a red alert for extreme heat. Tourists reported that the heat being too much and that the hours between 12 to 3 in an unbearably high temperature. When comparing the temperatures in New Delhi and Kolkata, it becomes clear exactly how high the temperature is. The highest temperature in Kolkata is 36 to 38 degrees Celsius, but it's already above 45 degrees Celsius over in New Delhi. Over the past decade, extreme hot weather in South Asia has become increasingly frequent. Extreme heat is also becoming a public health crisis in India as more than 150 people lost their lives in last year's heat wave. The chaos in New Caledonia continues. Australia and New Zealand began sending planes to New Caledonia to evacuate nationals after a week of deadly riots which was sparked by electoral changes from the French government. Two Royal Australian Air France players landed in Brisbane, carrying 108 Australians and other tourists stranded by the closure of the French Pacific Territories International Airport. Meanwhile, the New Zealand military flew 48 people into Auckland. Australia and New Zealand sent planes to New Caledonia on Tuesday to evacuate nationals after a week of deadly riots. The riot was sparked by electoral changes from the French government. France's High Commission in New Caledonia announced on Tuesday that the airport remains closed for commercial flights and the military will protect public buildings. Officials says thousands are stranded due to cancelled flights. Following last week's unrest there, streets in New Caledonia's capital, Noumea, are lined with charred vehicles and debris, with at least six people killed. Eyewitness videos showed burnt-out cars next to gutted car showrooms. Now the roads are being cleared with bulldozers removing burnt-out cars and rubble. The protests erupted last week among the indigenous Kanak people over a French amendment changing election participation rules, potentially diluting their vote. Pro-independence parties are demanding withdrawal of the electoral reform before resuming talks, while France insists on restoring order first. Well, let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. We have updates on the Israel-Palestine conflict. 
The International Criminal Court is seeking arrest warrants for the leaders of Israel and Hamas on war crime charges. Currently, both sides are strongly protesting while global responses remark equal slaps on the wrist are not enough to cause change. With thousands of civilians dead from the war in Gaza between Israel and Hamas, the International Criminal Court is now seeking arrest warrants for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Hamas's leader in Gaza, Yahya Sinwar. According to the ICC's Chief Prosecutor Karim Khan on Monday, the court is seeking warrants for both on charges of war crimes and crimes against humanity over the October 7th attacks on Israel and the subsequent war in Gaza. As well as crimes against humanity, of extermination and or murder, persecution and allegations of crimes of committing other inhuman acts. The warrant also includes Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant and two other Hamas leaders, Mohammed Diab Ibrahim al-Masri and Ismail Haniyeh. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu slammed the court's decision, calling it absurd and deceitful, adding that the move was meant to target the entire state of Israel. It is aimed against the IDF soldiers, who are fighting with the utmost bravery against the vile murderers of Hamas, who attacked us with horrendous brutality on October 7th. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden also criticized the ICC's decision, calling it outrageous, that it's seeking to arrest Netanyahu and other Israeli leaders. He stressed that there is no equivalence between Israel and Hamas. Hamas, too, has condemned the ICC. In a statement, Hamas separately denounced what it described as attempts to equate the victim with the executioner. Experts say that while it's unlikely that the Israeli and Hamas leaders will actually face prosecution, the arrest warrant could make it difficult for them to travel overseas, while a trial in court would be especially embarrassing for the Israeli government. Some surprising updates across the globe in relation to the conflict now. Ireland, Norway and Spain have announced their plans to recognize a Palestinian state from the 28th of May. Spain says the decision is not against Israel and is not in favor of Hamas, it is in favor of peace. Israel's Foreign Minister Israel Katz calls the three countries' decision a distorted step which shows that terrorism pays. Israel recalls it envoys Ireland and Norway urgent consultations and plans to do the same for its Spanish envoy. Ireland, Norway and Spain's move is welcomed by the Palestinian Foreign Minister and Hamas. At least 140 members of the United Nations already recognize Palestinian statehood, but not the UK or the US. The issue of the Palestinian statehood has vexed the international community for decades. And still on the conflict, we see retaliation from the EU. The Council of the European Union announced that ministers from EU member states have agreed to use proceeds from frozen assets of the Central Bank of Russia to support Ukraine's military efforts in the ongoing war with Russia. Therefore, more on this ground, we have other than world news special correspondent Minoli Sagaria from Kursk in Russia. Minoli? Yes, Minoli. Under the agreement, 90% of the profits or interest from these assets will be allocated to the European Peace Facility and EU-run fund providing military aid for Ukraine. The remaining 10% will be used for bolstering Ukraine's defense industry capacities and reconstruction needs. Russia has repeatedly criticized the asset seizure measures proposed by the US and other Western countries. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has said that the confiscation of Russian assets by the West in any form is viewed as theft. Russia will take reciprocal measures in response to this. According to the data from the Council, around 260 billion euros in CBR assets have been immobilized in securities and cash across the jurisdictions of the G7 partners, the EU and Australia. More than two-thirds of these frozen assets are held within the EU. Back to you, Vinod. Thank you, and that was Adha Dhrinavel News Special Correspondent Minoli Sagaria from Kursk in Russia. And now for updates on Trump's legal trial. Former US President Donald Trump is opted not to testify in his criminal hush money trial, bringing his defense into a quick conclusion and clearing the way for jurors to begin deliberations next week. The defense in Donald Trump's criminal hush money trial rested its case on Tuesday without calling the former U.S. president to testify. I'm testifying. I tell the truth. For weeks, Trump had stoked speculation about whether he would take the stand, telling reporters in April that he, quote, absolutely would. You plan to testify in your trial in New York? Yeah, I would testify, absolutely. It's a scam. 
but Trump ultimately opted not to take the stand in his own defense. Criminal defendants typically do not testify in their own trials, as it exposes them to probing questions from prosecutors. Trump's legal team called two witnesses on his behalf, including lawyer Robert Costello. He testified that Trump's former fixer, Michael Cohen, the prosecution's star witness, told him he did not have any incriminating information on Trump. Cohen's testimony wrapped on Monday. The defense attempted to get the case dismissed, arguing that the trial rested on the testimony of a person with a well-documented history of lying. But the judge indicated that he was inclined to let jurors assess Cohen's credibility for themselves. Trump, the first former president to face a criminal trial, is charged with falsifying business records to cover up a $130,000 payment to porn star Stormy Daniels in 2016, to keep quiet about a sexual encounter she says they had 10 years earlier. He has pleaded not guilty to the charges and denies ever having sex with her. The judge said jurors would return next Tuesday, following the three-day Memorial Day weekend, to hear closing arguments, with deliberations likely beginning the following day. On the road to the White House tonight, despite the legal dilemmas that the former president has been made to face, it is clear that the tide is turning slowly but surely in his direction. Several recent polls suggest that his Hispanic and Latino vote is shifting towards Donald Trump as the election moves closer. Previous polls showed 43% of Americans say that they would vote for President Joe Biden and 43% would vote for Trump if the election was held now. The election for the next president of the U.S. is currently extremely close, with other polls predicting similar tight results. Given the close race, the Latino votes and the Hispanic vote could be extremely important particularly in states which regularly swing between the Democrats and the Republicans in presidential elections. A look at the relationship between ethnicity and vote intentions in the survey shows that in the case of Hispanics, the figures are 45% for Biden and 39% for Trump. However, any move towards Trump among these groups is particularly interesting because they are increasing in numbers in the US over time and because Hispanics have historically lent towards the Democrats. According to the Pew Research Center, there were 62.5 million Latinos living in the U.S. in 2021, about 19% of the total population. The Hispanic population in the U.S. grew from 35 million in 2000 to 42 million in 2021. Well, it's going for a short commercial break now. More world news right after this. Welcome back. When you are on the go and tired from the journey, it's easy to take a small nap or two anywhere. It seems this gator thought the same as he powered down for a quick snooze. The only problem? His preferred sleep spot was in the middle of the road. What resulted was an awkward interaction for Florida authorities and the sleeping giant. You're just taking a nap? This alligator seemed to be taking a nap right in the middle of a Florida street. Body camera video from the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department shows a deputy cautiously approaching the gator. Oh, hi, big boy. <laughs> this happened early in the morning before daylight, so thankfully the alligator nap wasn't interrupting rush hour traffic. The deputy coaxed the gator from its unsafe position in the roadway. Come on. Don't be nasty. We were having friends. One human versus a nine-foot alligator isn't a challenge most people are willing to take on. Officers from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission arrived on the scene as backup. The sleepy gator was lassoed and moved. With a taped mouth, the alligator was picked up and placed in the bed of a truck. Okay, we're not going to throw him. We're going to gently place him in here. The last thing you want him to do is, is start. The last thing we want him to do is go crazy. Okay? Officials say the alligator was relocated to a safer spot to take his naps. Well, that is all the stories we have to report to you on World News Tonight. Tune in again tomorrow for more key global updates. Until then, have a good night.